Welcome to the Ecutec Race Form webinar. This section deals specifically with the Subaru WX and STI Race Form features. So, into um, really discussing the Race Form feature files for a particular vehicle. So, we're going to talk through primarily the um, Subaru WX STI, the um, Subaru BRZ uh, 86 and FRS, and Nissan GTR. These will be the ones that we're discussing in most detail. We'll also include um, where race forms available for the Nissan Duke, the Nissan 370Z, the Evo 10, Colt CZT, and the NPS. Although the features, not so many of the features were available on those models, we'll still um, cover them so you know exactly mm -hmm. what is and isn't available at this time. So, um, first up, we have. Um, Subaru WX and STI, which as we discussed will include, include Foresters and Legacies, um, depending on the exact model and region. Available for, this was our very first uh, Race One feature file. Um, we have two direct modes available on the STI, which is Road and Race. Um, so we, for the map switching, we have two sets of maps, one called Road, which would be by default, and one which is Race. We have uh, ignition map switching, so we can have one ignition map set up in uh, road mode and another ignition set up in race. We have a base ignition map and a, an ignition advanced map, so we have full control of octane um, compensation maps. For fueling, uh, map switching under fueling, we have the low detonation and the high detonation fuel maps, so these are available in road and race. We have the closed loop fuel targets. We have the injector scaling and the per gear fuel enrichment factor. So we can, um, uh, in race mode maybe, we can apply um, extra fuel in at high RPM, high speed. Um, injector scaling has been used by several dealers for ethanol content tuning. Closed loop fuel trim, nailing some dealers to run different AFR, closed loop AFRs in road and race and obviously the fuel maps being important um, for setting up your AFRs. Keeping the high depth fuel map so we've still got the engine safety in the event of lots of knock-in, the ECU will switch to the high depth fuel map and we retain all this um, safety functionality whether we're in road or race mode. We've got um, VVT in map switch so you can have one VVT set up for intake and exhaust on the dual cam models um, in road or in race. Per gear boost control, quite important. It was something that we developed very early on, about eight, nine years ago. Um, the um, the per gear um, boost control, very important on the Subaru, where the boost control is not great, enables us to set up the boost in different gears. Launch control, been very popular um, since we first did it. Flat foot shifting, again, um, <clears throat> enables us to change gear without lifting on turbo cars, keeping the pressure up so we've got full, we don't suffer from turbo lag and keep full power during the gear shift. Auto blip um, during down changing. Uh, speed density, um, again as we covered earlier where we can uh, remove the MAF sensor um, and run on a MAP based calibration or we have the hybrid mode where we can use um, both both set up so we could run the car um, on speed density idle if we're having math and reverberation problems due to a big math tube um, speed density on boost or we can swap round and we can we can control exactly when we want to swap and we'll go through that in the software per gear rev limits per gear and speed limiters so some people use the speed limiters for pit lane speed limiters when they're racing per gear rev limiters advantages really where you're able to maybe stretch that engine a little bit further than you would normally in the lower gears to hit target 0 to 60 0 to 100 times possibly um, quite often not really valued but very important is the custom data logging race rom enables us to um, log custom data parameters that might not be available from the factory ECU. Um, some cars just just don't have uh, knock or uh, will flatline boost control uh, very early on due to parameter scaling. Custom data logging enables us to get that important information back that the, 
that the factory wouldn't normally be able to supply. And quite importantly, uh, we all know you value your, your hard work, your tuned work, ROM security. So race ROM feature files enable us to um, apply the security. Quite often, if you take a standard ROM file, you program it in the ECU, you can program it in without a race ROM feature file. If you change one byte in that ROM file, we deem that a tuned ROM file. Um, you have made a change, it's your tuned work, you want to protect it. So the software Pro ECU will ask you to apply the race ROM feature file, which will mean the ECU will be protected from reading by competitors' tools, but also from other ECU tech tuners. Um, although the car has been tuned by yourself, it will be protected, but they will be allowed to program over, but they won't be able to read your data back, so it protects your ROM. It will also protect as well, which is kind of how ROM security came about, from um, the dealer tools, the dealer reflash tools. Uh, security was added very early on, back in around 2004, because things like the US STI, um, the car was going in for service or simply a new headlight bulb, a uh, car running big turbo, big injectors, and the technician would flash the ECU. That would leave the customer's car sat at a dealership, with large injectors, big turbos, you know, the car would hardly run, and the technician simply updated the ECU. So the, the security was actually added originally um, to stop that scenario happening where the car goes in and it gets updated. Technician thinks he's doing a good job, but he's not really. So, okay, if we now will just swap over, so bear with us a second, we're gonna swap over to Pro ECU and hopefully everybody's going to be able to see this. Now I've got quite a high res screen and you will see if, if you can't see my screen on your screen correctly, there's a few settings that you can change to squeeze it in. So if you're having problems then um, just let us know on the messages. Okay, so first up as discussed we're going to do the um, Subaru WX STI. Um, a lot of people don't know this, um, when we use remote assistance, which has been a feature we've added recently, it's been a very useful, um, a very useful tool, enable us to assist customers. Um, a lot of people don't realize that we can drag and drop ROM files direct onto the Pro ECU toolbar. So literally, I'm not going to use the menu to navigate, I'm just going to, I've got Windows Explorer open, I'm going to take a 2008 Euro STI, and you can see that as soon as we drag it on, it should appear. So we're just going to squeeze this window up to make it easier for everybody to see. And um, default openings live data, which is our data display and login page. And we're going to go to the maps page. So we can see here lots of different ways to view the maps. A lot of you guys probably know how to navigate this already, so please bear with us because there's a few, we've got quite a few new tuners now um, who are new to our product, so I do need to spend the time to go through some basic features of the software that some of you guys might take for granted. Um, drag and drop obviously being quite an important one. A lot of people don't realize they can do that. Um, opening all maps here, we just need to change a setting here. we go that's better um, so we've got um, different ways to display maps by function function they provide in the ECU maps by class the type of map is it a 1d value is it a 3d map uh, check the box list um, for things like diagnostic trouble codes there or we can view the maps in user level and quite often we're um, setting maps in beginner user level typical maps that you would need for tuning so leave in occasional maps, um, I don't know, open, close, loop control that you might not move would be a higher user level than something like a boost limit or a target fuel map, etc. We're working on improving that along with standardizing the names because as we've grown from Subaru, Nissan, Mazda, um, we're trying to keep the names as standard as possible so it's easy for you to familiarize yourself when using our product. Um, so the 
point worth noting here is you can use the top tabs here. We have name. You can click on it, user level, origin. This um, will enable you to order the maps either alphabetically. Um, yep, a very good point there. Um, some of you might not be aware, we're using um, ProECU here. ProECU was an update from last summer where we've amalgamated all of our different software uh, tuning platforms into one product. This makes it easier for us to manage, easier for us to develop. We had uh, several different products, Delta Dash, uh, some of your older customers, Flash 99, Flash 2002, Flash Evo. Very difficult for us to manage, very difficult for us to develop. We've now amalgamated the new products called Pro ECU. The only product that's not in Pro ECU at this time is an old Flash 99 product that's currently being added. Um, so if you're using any older products like Flashcam, Flash 2004, please update from our website to um, Pro ECU. Quite important. Pro ECU is the only product we now support. You can't build the older versions of software through Ecutech Update anymore. So if you have any problems, just update to Pro ECU, um, and that's the product that we support now. So um, yeah, back to the map list. Um, we can also add different um, features into the map structure. So here we have um, description, category, these are all things that we can add and remove. We can also um, make the text uh, larger and smaller. Um, using control D we can make the text smaller, might make it easier for some of you guys to see. And we can make it bigger again. We can also save the layout as default by using the view save ROM editor save ROM editor layout as default. This means when we close the ROM, reopen it again, we'll have the same column selected. So I'm going to remove description and I'm going to remove category and I'm just going to save that. Okay, so on for purpose. So at the moment this is a standard base ROM. This is the ROM that's in the ECU. Um, it doesn't have any additional race from features as standard. It's the one you will find in your Subaru directory uh, when you downloaded it from Ecutech Update. The race from tab is found here. At the moment, there's no race from feature files installed on this ROM file. To add, I'm just going to squeeze this up. To add a race from feature file, we simply click the add race from feature file here. Now some people can't see um, a mistake that we see quite a lot. Some people can't see the race from feature files when they try to open them from the top menu which is file open ROM file. I'll show you why in a minute. It's basically we're looking for an ERP file, an Ecutech ROM patch and only file extensions with ERP will be shown. So if you're trying to open a ROM file, that's a bin file, it's not going to show any ROM, uh, Ecutech race ROM patches in that window. So here we left click on it once and you can see on the right hand side displays which um, features, which exact features this race ROM feature file is going to display. So we can see here it's an Ecutech ROM patch, it's got um, a revision number that we use internally here, we can see it's for uh, an AN330-0182 ECU revision. This is a hardware part number. The calibration ID, Cal ID, listed there. This is actually a reflash version to fix um, some detonation problems that they have. And we can see the features that we're going to add. So we've got, for this particular ROM, uh, map switching, per gear boost control, per gear rev limits, launch control, auto blip, flat, flat foot shift, and speed density. Okay, we choose open, and we can see the, the race ROM feature file has been applied now to the standard ROM, and each individual feature is now listed in the text window here. Um, interestingly, again, you can add and remove race ROM feature file versions. Each one is unique. This is your unique number, um, 6302. It's tag version. You can remove, add and remove these from drag and drop. So from my, my computer Windows Explorer window on the right here, I'm going to take the race ROM feature file, drop it on the ROM file, and it's removed the race ROM feature file. I'm going to take it again, drag and drop, 
and it goes straight in. So you don't need to navigate using add race on feature file. Um, and um, navigate all through the windows to find the right version. So you can see all the race ROM feature files have now been added. We now see an extra menu, Ecutec race ROM maps. We can order them alphabetically and we can see what's just been added. The boost control, the cam timing, the fueling, injection, limiters and special features. Now it's worth noting at this point that when you apply a race ROM feature file, certain maps will be added. They will be copied from whatever your current settings are. So in the case of a load end fuel map here, this map was not stored in the race ROM feature file. It's been copied from the factory map that was already um, set. So when we go to maps by function and we go to fueling, We will see because we opened the standard ROM, the standard fuel map was copied across. If this was a tuned ROM of ours, maybe one we did last year, and for some reason um, the AFR is 11 to 1 AFR, we color on shape. When we applied the race ROM patch, at that moment it would have taken this um, factory map that we calibrated to 11 to 1, and it would have copied that across into the race ROM feature file. So when we apply the race ROM feature file, it will take our current fuel map and it will copy it across into our new race map. So this is our road map in the background here. We just abandon the changes. And our new race ROM map, which we just added for race mode, is shown here. So we also um, use the um, cursor keys, our own spacebar for navigation. Now we all know what it's like when you're driving along in a car and you're trying to use a mouse and your car's normally got hard suspension, race suspension, car's bouncing about, trying to use a mouse in a car is actually a nightmare. We've spent some time to help with this by using um, the cursor keys. So you can actually navigate all of Ecutech software by using the up arrow, down arrow, left and right, the enter, tab and spacebar. So we can go maps function, we choose the right cursor key, we go down maybe to um, fueling, we go right with the cursor key, it opens, we go down to fuel map, now here we can hit the space bar to open the map and it opens. The focus is still on the ROM editor on the left hand side, we hit space bar again and the map closes. We can use enter the return key. If we use return, the map opens, it's quite important. If you hit return again, the focus moves from the ROM across to the map on the right hand side. Now that might not seem like a big thing, but you're already on the map now and you can start moving and editing. So by using things like the shift key and the cursor keys, this is without using a mouse or a touchpad. So when you're in a car, it's much easier when a car's jumping about, you use your fingers on the keyboard try it. I mean, once you get used to it, you will find how quick you can navigate the product. Um, by using the escape key, the focus will come off of the map and go back to the ROM editor on the left-hand side. So escape, I'm back in again, space bar closes the map, left arrow, top of the tree, left arrow again, it's closed, left arrow again, function, close again, and I'm back in. So, um, yeah, just try using the keys. It's explained under the help file section as well. Um, we have various help files um, for using the software. Take some time to have a look through them. Um, there's quite a lot of information in there. So um, we've applied our race one patch now to our 2008 STI. We have um, map switching road and race. I'm going to follow the presentation. So the first one we're going to look at is ignition timing. So we go down to ignition timing and we can see we now have a new ignition map, base and advanced map. Um, these are used in race mode. When you map switch, they will be 
um, the ones chosen. On this Subaru STR we mapped switch by using um, the SI drive mode if we configure it that way or we can map switch by full throttle, full axle pedal and turn the heated rear window to the on position. So Race One is looking for you to be over 90% axle pedal position and it's looking for you to turn the heated rear window on. At that point, whichever mode you're in, it will swap to the next mode. So if at this point you're in road, it will swap to race. It will also be indicated by a rapidly flashing check engine cell light. So uh, rapid flashing is for racing. Uh, when you swap from race back to road, road mode is one big long flash for road driving. So race is rapid, road is slow flash. Um, <clears throat> adding the race from feature files giving us two sets of ignition maps. You see there's quite a lot of decimal points here, um, in particular one cell here. You know, that's seven characters in one cell, four decimal places not needed. We can use, um, again, using the navigation, we can use the view fewer significant points. Control-Alt-F very quickly takes us down to no decimal points. This is very good um, to look at the map visually, especially with colour, which will show you holes in the maps. Um, so by taking the decimal points away, fewer significant points, it's much easier to see progression in the map, which is important for your tuning. 5, 22, 19, it's very progressive, which is good. It's harder to see that when you have lots of decimal points. We've got five there. I mean, it's just crazy. It's very difficult to see um, um, the, the progression in the map. Okay, so this is the, the base map. Most of you guys may already know this. I'll just cover it quickly. Um, the base map is the ignition timing you will get when the advanced multiplier is zero. This is like your worst case scenario map. Depending on your fuel quality, altitude, um, compression, age of the engine, uh, is it burning oil, these sort of factors, the advanced multiplier will the dynamic advance multiplier would constantly change in to get the maximum ignition advance that you can. It does this by adding the ignition advance map. Ever so quickly, it says more for a separate um, a webinar really, but if the advance multiplier is zero, the car's not very happy, and if for example this map was filled with 20 degrees and the advance multiplier is zero, then we will have 20 degrees. If the Ignition advance map is filled with 10 degrees. For example, this is only for example, don't do any tuning like this please. Um, then if the advance multiplier is zero, we will still have 20 degrees timing. If the advance multiplier is one, we'll have 100% of this map added to the base map. So at this particular point, it's 10.8, if we just increase it slightly to 10. So when the advanced multiplier is 1, we will have 100% of the advanced map added to the base map. Our ignition timing will be 30 degrees. If the advanced multiplier is 0 0.5, we'll have 50% of this map. So this would be 5 degrees added to the base map. Our ignition timing would be 25. This is plus or minus any learning um, that may have taken place. The reason for this weird shape map, quite often we're asked why has this map got this shape, it's to do with different um, different regions, different models, some cars have better pistons than others, you'll find in things like Japanese, domestic market, JDM, STIs, they've got very good pistons, the values be much higher, much more resilient to debt, whereas cars with like the Forester run lower pressure, um, smaller intercoolers, more susceptible to detonation, the values in this map will be smaller, so the advanced multiplier will tend to be more active. Okay, so back on the subject. So we can have two sets of maps, um, the base ignition map and the advanced map in road or race, enable us to use dual fuel if required. We can have a high octane and low octane map. Um, maybe the customer goes to the track, he uses race fuel, then you'd set up the race mode uh, more aggressively than the road mode. Okay, so um, next we move on to the fuel maps. So here we have quite a few more maps. We have the basic uh, fuel map, high debt and low debt. The uh, low debt, low detonation, car's not detonating, it's very happy, um, is a fuel map here. Um, this is used most of the time. If the engine's knocking badly, the advanced multiplier will decrease. 
at that point, I think the stock value is around 0.35. Um, the advanced multiplier drops below around 0.35, depending on the exact ROM version, then the ECU will simply switch from the, the low depth fuel map to um, the high depth fuel map, which is generally slightly richer. In this point, not so much. Let's increase. Yeah, it's not a lot of difference there, 9.96, 10.05, but it can be just enough to keep the um, engine quiet where required. Uh, there's a different fuel strategy primarily on the US models where there's a base map and there's two compensation maps, um, but they, that's for um, another webinar to get into that this time. So basically in road and race we can offer two sets of fuel maps, um, the high debt and low debt, so if you are tuning always make sure that you're High debt, i.e. engine knocking, is always richer than your low debt. It's very easy to forget about your high debt, and quite often you could end up, for various reasons, with a high debt map that's leaner than your low debt. <clears throat> okay, closed loop fuel trim. So during closed loop, stoichiometric fuel ratio uh, lambda 1 is achieved, and this is a fine tuning map which will... Um, just allow you to fine tune if you've got holes in your map for various reasons you can adjust your fuel trim, your closed loop fuel trim using this map. Obviously there's a transition time where it will go from closed to open loop and you know areas of the map that seem to have strange values, why has it got 0.85 um, it's worth noting these are lambda values um, why has it got 0.85 lambda at 5000 revs and 1.6 engine load, it's you know that area of the map that will probably never be reached during closed loop but there's always these transition situations and just because somebody at the factory thinks oh we never use closed loop over 3600 revs that doesn't matter it's bad practice not to profile the map so they're just like if for some reason we end up with closed loop at 5000 revs and 1.6 bar we want to make sure our closed loop target is going to put plenty of fuel in Okay, so there's your closed loop fuel trim, enabling you to run different closed loop AFRs quite often, cams and things, um, race fuel, you might want to make your, um, your closed loop um, lambda value like 0.95 or 14 to 1, and you can use this map to do it. Injector scaling, um, injector scaling quite useful, certainly in these days of um, ethanol tuning, the 85, we don't actually have it in the UK. Um, that is available at various places in Europe. We've just recently been doing some testing with ethanol and realised really right, we're quite jealous and envious of you guys who can buy it at the pumps because um, yeah, obviously there's a lot more power available. Using the injector flow scaling, it's crude but it does work. Uh, quite a few of you guys have been using it now. Um, simply increasing the injector flow scaling, is it increasing or decreasing? Um, by around 25% will give you more injection volume and pretty much will cope reasonably well. Um, somebody might come up and correct me, I think we have to make it, which way do we go with the injector scaling? Perhaps somebody can email in and tell me which way I have to go with it, who's got some experience with it. <laughs> um, okay, per gear. Decrease. Decrease, there we go, decrease. So. If you run ethanol, you take your injector flow scaling down, say 25%, and um, so we go percentage. If we say 75%, making it smaller, that means the ECU is going to think the injectors are smaller. So to deliver a required volume of fuel, it will open the injector for longer. Injector millisecond will be greater. We'll get a larger fuel delivery. Um, so it should work out pretty well. Okay. Uh, per gear fuel enrichment, again, um, this feature was added to request of tuners. We, it enables us to add a fuel enrichment feature in each gear against engine speed. We have to enable this feature using the checkboxes here, so they're not enabled by default. Um, this is the enrichment percentage factor. The road and race mode, you can set it up in either, but basically you're looking for things like where you want to run it um, perhaps slightly richer at high speed, high RPM. This gives you the ability to do it. You can run it leaner in the lower gears, a quick buzz through the gears, you can get away with it being leaner. So these maps are available to do that. Obviously we don't want that enrichment factor applied all the time. If we're in closed loop at 3000 RPM in fourth gear, 
we don't want an enrichment factor added, so we use the um, per gear enrichment map threshold to set when the per gear enrichment maps can work. So maybe we only want it over a bar of boost, uh, maybe we want it over two bar of boost absolute, so only over 15 psi boost. Um, this is where we set is hysteresis, so on this one it's going to be over 1.1 bar, um, the maps will become active, and as the boost drops again back below one bar absolute, um, it will stop the map from working. <laughs> okay, people have got specific questions, post them on. I can't say that we'll get to them all now, and if we don't get to answer them during the webinar, then please um, um, email us afterwards and we can answer them. We get quite a few questions coming in, and I should think they're all going to be flying in during the webinar. Okay, Pergy Fuel In. Um, let's leave that one for the moment. Sweet entity. Let's go into um, VBT. Um, cam timing. So, this particular Euro STI dual VBT intake and exhaust, you can do. Um, different cam profiles for road and race if you choose. Personally, never seen anything great come from um, European models, certainly, SDI cam tuning, not like what we could get from Evo 10s and GTRs, but equally, moving intake and exhaust cams around, you can affect um, combustion pressures and turbo speeds, so they're there to play with, and obviously with aftermarket cams and things, it's critical to be able to set these up. So, cam timing straightforward. Um, next one, per gear boost control. So, up to boost control. So, as discussed earlier, lots of boost maps. Uh, might seem a bit daunting to start with, but we've got a desired boost. This is your target boost pressure in bar, um, and there's one available for each gear. Now, I'm pretty sure on the STI, like in the BRZ, is uh, possibly, I'm, I'd need to refer to the manual on that. I, I think it's just on the... No, I'm sure it's on the STI. If only the first map is used, it will be used for all the gears, so no need to calibrate all the maps. I Okay, so if we don't enable it, first gear will be used. If we do enable it, then it will use all six maps. So sometimes it's a bit of a pain trying to set up all six maps. If you don't specifically want... Um, per gear boost control for each gear, the map one will be used if you don't enable it. Okay, so, so basically this is a copy of the standard map. Again, if you're thinking on and you're going to add a race from feature file, if you've got a tuned file already, maybe the car's already calibrated 2.4, 2.5 bar, then um, apply your race from feature file to your tuned ROM and then all your six desired boosts will get a copy of your tuned desired boost map and you won't have to copy and paste them all. Um, Six maps for road, six maps for race. Along with the per gear boost, we have per gear wastegate duty. And because it's a Subaru, we have two maps. We have the initial wastegate duty when you stamp on, and we have the max wastegate duty, which is the maximum it can achieve. Um, the values are normally within 10% of each other. You should always, for good boost control, keep your wastegate duties really within about 10% of each other. Your proportional, your integral boost compensations are only going to be able to act so far. A good practice during your tuning is to set your initial and your max is the same. Say you want 2.2 bar, get your wastegate duty set up so it's tight. So you, you know, you're hitting 2.2 bar, you're almost hitting 2.2 bar. And then you can increase your max. So on that hot day or maybe just after starting when you're not hitting your target boost, DC will increase the boost pressure from your initial to your maximum to maintain your target boost pressure. So keep the same during tuning and then afterwards you can separate them and on that final run just make sure you're hitting your target boost. Okay, per gear wastegate duty, straightforward. Uh, one in road, one in race. Okay. Next one, launch control. So launch control comes under our Race ROM special features menu. 
you can um, enable uh, launch control in either road or race so the customer doesn't have to have it all the time so this is where you set that up LC abbreviation launch control FFS flat foot shift AB auto blip whilst we are um, um, on here we can configure them differently but I'd advise for, for customers sake that if you're going to use launch control and flat foot shift that you either enable it in both modes or you enable it in just one of the modes so it's clear each time you know which feature is going to work in which mode we also have a security feature um, for flat foot shift which um, I'll go into in a minute when we discuss the feature so launch control lots of different um, settings for launch control it's been re revised I'm going to add the description tab in here now which will help me discuss them um, let's take away user level let's add in here let's decrease and get him out so launch control I'm just going to um, jiggle the screen over so I want to make sure everybody can see the maps <clears throat> so during while conditions for launch control to work so Equitech have to define when we want to use launch control so certain things we need to have we need to have um, a clutch switch we need to know if the car is in gear or not and we need to check the position of the axle fill. So for um, we put in default values when we apply the race on patch for launch control to work. They're not normally very aggressive, they're quite conservative. We want the feature to work, but we don't want it to be on the limit. We provide you guys with as much access as we can to the control setup, so you can set it up how you want. How we set it isn't always the best, but it's safe, it works, it shows the feature working, you can make it more aggressive, less aggressive, as you please. When we go into launch mode, the F-fuel ratio is um, controlled by the ECU, and it may well be 14.7. Um, if the ECU decides that it wants to be in closed loop at that time, then you can have quite a lean F-fuel ratio while you're launching. With the AFR adjustment, we can literally increase that fuel injection volume by a percentage. So it may well be working on injector millisecond. So if the injector milliseconds are two milliseconds, then add in 50%, it's going to take it, add one millisecond, injection period is going to be three milliseconds. Add in a, um, a given a richer AFR, a fuel enrichment factor. Okay, next, ignition timing while stationary. So while we're in launch mode, we retard the ignition timing. Um, each map's got a help file, please, if you're not sure, have a look. Um, there's also the race ROM feature files are covered under the help files, help race ROM feature file guide, shown here. So this is ignition retard um, during launch. So you're in launch mode, the ignition timing will be retarded by 20 degrees during launch. This will, a uh, retarded ignition timing will slow the engine speed, reduce engine torque, um, keeping the RPM down, enable us to get airflow through the engine, getting the turbo spooling. Launch control, maximum engage speed. So launch control can only work over 8 kilometers an hour. Below this speed, you will not be able to engage launch control. Over 8 kilometers an hour, probably 5 mile per hour. Um, minimum engage RPM. So this is the um, launch control will not engage below this engine speed. So let me think a second, a little while because I've used this. So to engage launch control, you're going to need to be able to um, pull up, dip the clutch. You've got to be below 8 kilometers an hour, full throttle, launch control will not come in below the 4,000 RPM. minimum axle pedal 50% axle pedals we need a minimum of 15% accelerator pedal to engage launch control mode 
Now, launch control limit. This is the um, when we engage launch control, this is the hysteresis value. So launch control is basically an engine rev limiter, a bit like when we hit the rev limiter at 7,000 RPM. The hysteresis value is the on-off of the fuel cut, which is basically what the rev limiter is. With a value of 20 RPM, the the rev limit, the launch control, will seem quite harsh, quite aggressive. If we make this number bigger, maybe 200 RPM, it will feel a lot softer. For fear of looking stupid, the 20 RPM will be like a machine gun noise, and the 200 RPM will be a lot softer, a lot more dampened, more like a bup, 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 bup. Um, less strain, it will sound like it's less stress on the engine. Um, the launch control rev limit is a progressive, this was um, a change that we made originally, it was against vehicle speed, and after discussion with a few of the tuners, testing, um, we decided to put this against time, and it gives us a progressive launch, so that um, we can hold the limiter during launch against the time period. The launch, um, engaging launch control mode is when we dip the clutch and we go full throttle, more than 50% throttle. We don't want to hold launch control for a long time, but as soon as we release the clutch, then the launch control will be held, at this point, for a one second period. We've got progressive limiter as we launch. So if we get too much wheel spin, we take the numbers down. If we've got too much traction, maybe the car bogs, we can go up with the values, put more power to the tyres during the launch. Flat foot shift. So uh, flat foot shift, as discussed earlier, is full throttle gear change. So normally during gear change, we lift off the throttle, dip the clutch, change the gear, clutch out, throttle back down again. Flat foot shift enables us to keep the throttle pressed, keep the throttle open. Um, normally if we did this without flat foot shift feature, the RPM would just go to the limiter, set on the limiter, not very good. So we can control um, the engine speed during the gear shift. So to engage flat foot shift, we need a minimum of 60% axle pedal. This is so that when we're driving normally, that flat foot shift doesn't come in when we don't expect it to. So we need, a, you know, we need to be on the power over 60% axle pedal for flat foot shift to work. Minimum vehicle speed, 40 kilometers an hour, probably around 30 mile per hour. We don't want it working at low speed. Um, if you feel you do want it working speed, just change this value, drop it down and it will work. During flat foot shift, we want to retard the timing. We want to take the torque off the engine. So by retarding the timing, minus 20 degrees there, it will pull the torque out, stop everything getting too hot. We'll also encourage after burning the exhaust manifold, keep the turbo speed up. During flat foot shift, quite important, we can control the fuel in as well. Last thing we want is, you know, a car tuned car running one and a half bar of boost during flat foot shift running lambda one. So again, keep the fuel in there, keep everything nice and cool across the combustion chamber, fuel enrichment factor during flat foot shift. During flat foot shift, we have to control engine speed. So scenario is we are accelerating, maybe third gear, 5,000 RPM, we're going to change gear. These hysteresis values, 200 and 180, which are our default settings, if we change gear at 5,000 RPM, engine speed, when we dip the clutch, will increase to 5,200 RPM. The limiter will cut in at 5,200, i.e. the injectors will be cut. The engine speed will drop to 5,180, the injectors will come back on, the engine speed will go up to 5,200, the injectors go off. So we'll have this initial rise um, in engine speed, it will be held during the shift, clutch out and then it's released again. You could make these values 0, um, maybe 20 and 0, so the RPM will stay where it is. You can also make a negative. So you're at 5,000 RPM. If these were minus 200 and minus 180, what will happen is the second that you dip the clutch is the engine speed will actually drop and it will feel like the power has died. So we keep them positive values. The engine flares slightly during the gear shift. The other thing worth noting at this time, which is quite important, is to lock the wastegate duty during flat foot shifts. Because what can happen, especially with the ignition retard and the extra fuel, is we'll get a boost spike during gear change. Um, the other thing is your wastegate duty may well be stable controlling your boost, 50% wastegate duty. During flat foot shift there will be a change in boost pressure, target boost and actual boost, 
and the um, interval and proportional turbo dynamics will try to adjust the wastegate duty to hit the target boost. So um, it's suggested that you lock the wastegate duty because in that split, split second that you do flat foot shift, then um, uh, lock the wastegate duty during that flat foot shift and when you come back off the power again, you'll find that the boost pressure is very similar to how it was before. It worked quite well. Okay. Auto blip. So auto blip is a feature that we've added um, and shortly after I do believe Nissan copied us and added it on the 370Z. Uh, I shouldn't claim that actually, that's not strictly true. Auto blip is um, a feature, yeah, well received. Um, it will blip the throttle on gear changing. A lot of people expect it to work at lower speeds and lower RPM. You don't really want it working at low RPM. Um, it's designed to be working scenario where you're um, on the racetrack, you're flat out down the main straight, you lift for the corner, so you've got tight corner coming up, you would first of all lift off the power, next thing you do, hard on the brakes, next thing you do, down through the gearbox. It's that scenario when it's going to work. So the conditions for auto blip to work are going to be off the throttle, you're going to be on the brake, then you're going to do the clutch. If you lift off the throttle and then go on the clutch and then the brake it's not going to work it's off the throttle on the brake down through the box the second that you go on the clutch then the auto blip is going to run it's only going to our default settings it's only going to work over 60 kilometers an hour and it's going to blip the axle pedal 40 percent axle pedal against rpm so below 3000 rpm not doing very much over 3000 say 5000 rpm it's going to be like pushing the accelerator pedal while you're downshifting and holding it there for 0.3 of a second. If you make this number bigger, maybe half a second or one second, you're going to get more of a rev. 45% axle pedal at 5,000 revs is going to give you a nice little flare on the downchanging. If you halve these values, it's going to be hardly noticeable. If you double these values, you're going to get a big stab of the throttle every time you're going down through the box. Okay. That's auto blip. So next one, what have we got? We have um, limiters I'm just going to go into. Um, per gear rev limiters. Um, we can enable the per gear rev limiter in road or race. Um, the hysteresis mm -hmm. for the rev limiter. Um, as discussed, you can have different rev limiters in different gears. <clears throat> um, the purpose of the per gear rev limiters is, as discussed before, it might allow you to hit um, might allow you to hit certain um, drag racing targets you know like 0 to 60 0 to 100 sometimes you know first gear get the car rolling you know you can stretch it that extra mm -hmm. two three hundred rpm um, but in the higher gears you wouldn't in fifth or sixth gear want to keep it held there uh, even third gear so this enables you to control the engine speed in different gears and you can control it differently in road and race Enable the feature in the enable per gear rev limits. Okay, vehicle speed, um, as mentioned earlier, speed limiter here. Um, this is uh, not shown particularly well. Let's drag it out, make it bigger. Um, one is 100% throttle, 20% is 20% of throttle. Don't change these values here, it doesn't work very well. Use the speed on the left hand side in kilometers an hour. So you can see over 250 kilometers an hour will have, let's say, 100% of torque, 100% butterfly coming down to 20% at 255 kilometers an hour. Now, if we wanted a, a speed limit 150, if we just select both target vehicle mm -hmm. speeds, add minus 100, we're down to 150 kilometers an hour. So the speed limit is going to click in. 150 kilometers an hour and the butterfly will close down to 20% by 155 kilometers an hour. Okay, just one second. <laughs> okay, um, so per gear. Um, final one, speed density. Um, in the STI it's labelled under um, fueling on the BRZ and 86 
it's now in its own category along with GTR. So we can use speed density um, on its own, so full map based, or we can use math. Um, we also have hybrid where we can use both of them. So let's take out the descriptions, the map's all going to get a bit bigger. So speed density map is shown here. So the speed density principle that Equitech use is a manifold pressure RPM table with the output being mass airflow in grams per second. This works um, extremely well. Um, we can use it for a variety of reasons. We can use it when we've got big matches, mac reverberation. Um, it will be more stable under manifold pressure. We can also use it to do th things like math scaling, where we can enable speed density. We've still got the math sensor fitted to the car, and by logging the output of the math tube, um, we can create a new 2D map scale uh, very quickly using the car running on SD. SD, I'm not a massive fan of personally. Um, it has its limitations, and that's why manufacturers use uh, math sensors. They're more accurate for different changes in temperature um, and density, which is why you know, manufacturers do use them. But I appreciate in situations, um, speed density can be used. It is very popular, and it does work extremely well. The output of this table, you should understand, will replace the 2D math scale value. So if you imagine your stock car running on math, you get a math voltage input, and for a certain math voltage, you get a mass airflow in grams per second. It's when you enable speed density, it's at that point Ecutech replace the math signal with the output of this map. So the output of this map will replace the 2D math sensor. Um, it will affect ignition timing and fueling because engine load is calculated directly from mass airflow. So to enable speed density, um, we need to use the enable speed density checkbox and we turn it on here. If we don't enable it, it's not going to work. Okay. Using hybrid mode, we can use speed density at idle and math on full power. We can use math at idle, speed density on full power whichever way we want. Um, using the enable below thresholds instead of above means we can have either way. We can set it so that um, speed density will only work over a certain RPM. It will only work over a certain manifold pressure. It will only work over a certain math reading. If you want, um, you can set conditions up for all three of these, or you can choose just one of them. You could say that the speed density activation is only going to work over 4,000 RPM. So we'd put F2 to enter, we put 4,000 in the top one, F2, 3, 9, 00 in the bottom one, we save, Control S to save, Control Q to quit, closes the map, we can see it's highlighted red, so it's only going to work over 4,000 RPM. If we want to enable it against manifold pressure, we can add manifold pressure conditioning as well, and math as well. So we can set up exactly when we want it to work, and what conditions we want to be met, for it to work. Okay. Um, important with speed density changes in air temperature. There's a base calibration in here. So for colder temperature, we've got a 15% uh, compensation. Hotter temperature here, 85% compensation. And importantly, with manifold pressure, there are certain conditions where we will. Um, roll on the throttle and we'll get a lean hesitation. We can use this 3D map, this throttle delta compensation as a factor for engine load, um, primarily mass airflow, um, and an enrichment factor that's going to be applied relative to throttle movement, so the rate of throttle change. So if we go on the throttle really slowly, the butterfly opens really slowly, this table is going to have very little effect. If we roll on quickly, maybe we're off the gas, we're going very quickly, the butterfly is going to open quickly, rate of manifold pressure change is not going to be quick enough to detect and the ECU to react with the injectors, we're going to get a hesitation. This map here will counteract that and if you find you do get hesitations, you make this map bigger. If the car goes too rich as you roll on the throttle, you make this map smaller. Throttle delta compensation. Okay, um, so 
almost done for race rom features for STI. This um, race rom on STI also includes rom security as discussed earlier. So um, by applying the race rom feature file, you will add security to your rom. You'll find that you'll be prompted um, um, to add the race rom feature file, even even if you're not using race rom. The software will still keep prompting you to apply it. It's basically telling you that you can protect your work if you want to, um, and applying the race rom feature file, even if you don't use any of the features, will protect your work against other products. Um, if you don't want security, some misconceptions are once a car's program with Ecutech can't be used with anything else. That's only applicable on the old non-driver wire Subarus, um, which is for technical reasons something we can't reverse very easily. But on all other products that we do, Nissan, Subarus, Mazdas, Toyotas, um, you just put back standard file and security is removed and it will appear as a standard ECU. So don't be afraid to use the race run of security. Another a uh, powerful, important feature of race ROM is uh, the race ROM feature file is we're able to data log, we're able to take parameters from the memory that are not available from the factory ECU. So we can see here there's an important tab in the data login called origin. This shows where the parameter is coming from. And if we order by units, you see it's nicely colored, the, the custom Ecutech parameters don't show very easily. If we order by origin, very quickly, everything in red are custom Ecutech parameters pulled from memory. Important uh, parameters like throttle delta, so we can see the throttle delta input for the speed density map. Um, advanced multiplier engine load custom parameters, knock sensor input, you can log the knock sensor noise input, the voltage. Uh, wastegate duty, initial and max, help you fine tune your um, wastegate duty your boost control. So primary wastegate duty is your actual wastegate duty at this moment. The initial and the max are the output of your initial and max maps. So as long as your initial is lower than your primary wastegate duty and your max is higher than your primary wastegate duty at that time, then you're going to have very good boost tuning. Boost error shows the difference between your um, desired boost and your actual boost. Very good for seeing when you've got temperature compensations that take an effect. You can fill your map with 2.2 bar boost. It doesn't mean you're going to get it if you've got high intake air temp comps, coolant temp comps, uh, atmospheric pressure compensations. So check your desired boost error. You might have perfectly control boost at 2 bar, but you want 2.2. But if your boost error is zero, there's something else going on that's stopping you reaching that target. Internal boost reading, uh, limitations of the factory diagnostic parameter from Subaru. Manifold relative will only read to... 1.17 bar um, manifold absolute will read to 2.5 bar 2.55 bar absolute um, but internal boost reading will allow us to read past 2.55 and some cars have three bar map sensors fitted allows to read up to 2.3 bar or I think standard sensors are actually go all the way to 2.72 bar so unless you run over 2.72 you should be able to use the factory sensors um, math sensor, this is what I was talking about earlier with speed density, so you go and put a 3 inch math tube on the car, it doesn't run very well, um, you can turn the speed density on and assuming the car is relatively stock, um, it's not you know different compression ratio, massive cams or anything, the car will run quite well on speed density, put your 3 inch math tube on, um, make a power run on the car and log the output of the math sensor and you can see what the math is reading compared to what the speed density is reading. The car runs well on speed density. Your math will be reading low because it's a 3-inch math tube. It's very quick and easy by analyzing the log file to create a new 2D math curve. Desired torque is your current target torque from the axle pedal. And calculated mm -hmm. torque is the feedback. Um, it doesn't have a strain gauge on the prop shaft. It doesn't know the torque, but there's um, torque tables that they use for factory calibration. Um, which which have been calibrated for a given engine load. Changing these tables is not going to change the way the car runs. On Certainly on the 2008 STI um, up to at least 2011, changing the torque values in these maps, um, increasing the desired torque will give you more throttle opening, but increasing the torque values over stock values is not going to give you any more power. For a torque demand, 
you will get a certain boost pressure, i.e. desired boost map. If you want more boost pressure, then simply ask for more boost pressure. No need to really be changing the maximum values in the desired torque maps. It just complicates your calibration really, it doesn't gain any more. Um, some critical ignition um, parameters here. Uh, quite important for tuning and understanding your tuning. AK is um, ignition correction is your immediate knock retard. This is the amount of, these, of ignition retard the ECU's applying at this time. The AP value above is your learned ignition correction. So maybe your AK has pulled minus four degrees, then um, the ECU will store fifty percent of that learned value, maybe in minus two. Um, next time round as we pass, the learned value is going to be a minus 2, so our AP value is going to show minus 2. Um, AT is the course correction, is the output of your ignition advance map that we filled with 10 degrees earlier. If the advance multiplies 1, then AT is always going to read 10 degrees. If the advance multiplier is 0.5, then AT is going to be 5 degrees, and it will vary with um, advance multiplier. Okay, so there's um, pretty much all the custom parameters done for this STI. These parameters vary from ECU to ECU. Sometimes not all of them are available. Sometimes if it's a ROM that we've done a lot of development work on, a lot of disassembly on, then it may have extra parameters that we use during testing and development. So it does vary from ECU. We try to keep this list, um, these parameters available in as many ECUs as we can. Okay. So I think that pretty much um, covers Subaru WX STI. This was our first race ROM feature file development. Um, we've had one or two iterations of it. Um, the later, primarily the 86 BRZ and the um, GTR um, are a development on top of this with more again. So, okay, let's have some. <clears throat> so as we can see, we can um, add columns here um, that we can change the layout and we can save the layout here, save the layout of the ROM editor so we can make it smaller, we can increase it. Now what quite often that happens for technical reasons at the moment, we can't change the setup um, the template. So when you add, I don't know, let's say knock input and um, initial wastegate max wastegate duty if you save this layout it, it won't save the individual parameters so next time you reopen you will have to add them in again uh, I know it can be annoying at times and development team very much aware of this feature not working um, it's just for technical reasons we can't save it at this time but hopefully in the future we will get that added um, okay right so we can see I've edited one map here, it's red, it's not been saved, we haven't saved the ROM file, um, so at this time it's red and I don't want to save it. Incidentally, when I do save ROM files, I make a point of saving the race ROM feature file in the name. It then tells you in the future when you look at it, what uh, race ROM feature file has been added to that ECU and you know that you've got a, um, a special version on there. In addition as well, you can save the ROM description, maybe it's your stage one, your stage two, you can add the comment in here as well. And you simply save the ROM file or save the customer key ROM file, which is very important uh, for the master tuners, um, to protect your work. So if you're emailing files to customers, they'll be protected as well. If you're not sure how to use the uh, ROM keyed setup, there's a help file and um, I intend in the future to do you know, a small webinar just on how to use ROM key and what it's, how it works and um, what you can achieve from it. So, save the changes, no. Nope.